This video is sponsored by Skillshare. 2018 has been pure garbage juice. But when discussing garbage juice, the thing that left the garbage juiciest taste in my mouth was the bloody happy time murders. Ugh. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not some feeble-minded Muppet hater. The Muppets are what I would describe as peng juice. They're quirky, weird, generally funny, colourful, and have all the makings of being proper radical after a comb. But Happy Time Murders has none of these things. It's shit, crap, trash, and overall garbage juice, as I've already said. Now, I know what you're saying. This is just standard Melissa McCarthy gavno. What expectations could you possibly have going into this? Well, if, like me, you research films before you wrote YouTube videos on them, then you would know that Happy Time Murders was directed by Brian Henson, the guy who did bloody Muppets Christmas Carol, which is a smashing banger. So what the fuck happened here? Happy Time Murders was originally announced over 10 years ago. It was the cinematic launch of Henson Alternative, the Henson Company's new label for content created specifically and exclusively for adults. He was working on this film for 10 years, under the Henson name. He had a lot riding on this. The end product is a film so grotesque, so aggressively unfunny, so dull, bland and boring that I have to say it's the worst of 2018. However, in order to gain an understanding on how this frolicking, beautiful world of the Muppets has been starved and wrangled of all its creativity and art, we need to look into what that world was before its scarring. So sit back and relax and enjoy a nitpicks video essay about Muppets and this Melissa McCarthy film and why it's not good. But very quickly, I just wanted to briefly mention that we now have official Nitpicks merch available to ship worldwide. Have a look at nitpicks.co.uk, it's the best way to support the channel while looking good at the same time. Jim Henson grew up on a farm and then when he was big he became a puppet man. He did puppet man business and created waves and ripples until he finally made the big success which was known as Sea Sam Street. He taught children about triangles, numbers and the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Henson was the leading figure in a hugely successful kids TV show, but he still wasn't satisfied. His true love was for his fabulous felt monsters which he'd been developing all through his career, something that would make man, child and old hag let out loose chuckles from the their face holes. But his big dream was to come true when he was commissioned by the government in the 70s to make The Muppet Show. This became the most successful show on earth. I'm not even joking, it had the highest viewing figures of any TV show ever. You can google that shit, it's true. I'm just gonna google it to make sure. Muppets most viewed TV show. Yep, see, that's Time Magazine talking. Not me, Time Magazine. So why was this the most popular show on earth? Well, because simply, it's lit. The Muppet Show managed to create a surreal, palpable world which exists within its own chaotic rules. Each character is defined, likeable and relatable. There's a larger than life colour to the way they speak and move which couldn't be emulated by humans. The humour never panders either, it's applicable to almost anyone. The puppeteers on the show were the best in the world, with some of the most expressive puppets and talented voice actors. We're talking about Frank Oz people, which the nerds watching this will know as the man who voiced fungus in Monsters Inc. There just simply wasn't anything else like The Muppet Show, and no producers were able to emulate it. The Muppets dominated the world for five years until Jimmy Jim Jim just went, nah, fuck it, this is boring, I'm bored, I'm stopping this Muppet shit, and I'm gonna make some films. Jim Henson directed two films, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. He also directed the second Muppet film, but honestly, who cares? Not me. I'm just gonna pretend that it didn't happen, no one will even notice anyway. So yeah, he directed two films. The first was Dark Crystal, which is a pretty intense fantasy film which no one understood and made no money. So after the failure of Dark Crystal, Jim Henson decides to knuckle down, hire Monty Python's Terry Jones, get on board David Bowie to do the soundtrack and play the villain, and make his masterpiece, Labyrinth, a film which no one understood and made no money. Then Jim Henson died. Oh. But despite all that, these films are special. They're now cult classics as they ooze atmosphere with amazing character designs, sets and voice acting. Labyrinth particularly is an outstanding film full of fantastic wit and charm. Every aspect of this film looks like it took a ridiculous amount of time and effort to execute perfectly. And then Dark Crystal is just full on weird. It's so dense with its lore and world. It gets to a point when you're watching vulture people screeching at each other and hitting a rock with a sword and it's just a cinematic experience like no other. They're now making a Netflix show out 
out of this, which will probably be pretty decent considering neither Brian Henson or Melissa McCarthy have anything to do with it. After the release of Labyrinth, Jim Henson started talks with Disney to sell the Muppets to them, but the talks with Disney were so damn stressful that he died before the deal was finalised. After this, the Muppet throne was inherited by his 29-year-old son, Brian Henson, who you know, sort of smashed it with his directional debut. I'm not wrong in thinking that A Muppet's Christmas Carol was the introduction to the Muppets for many people in my age group. Granted, for a while, that was my only attachment to the Muppets. I used to watch that movie every Christmas, no matter where or what I was doing. My mum could be glugging down the gin. My dad could be staying out late in the betting shop. Grandfather screaming upstairs because of his dementia hearing my sister weeping in the room next to me because once again someone heartless and objectifying had broken her heart. No matter any of that, you would always catch me sitting in my wardrobe with my portable DVD player, watching Muppet's Christmas Carol with the headphones on to block out all the yelling. And it always reminded me that, you know, it was worth it. Things were worth holding out for and it would always be okay. Just like every year without fail, I could go to that film and Michael Caine would always come to that same conclusion with the help of those cheeky Muppets. No matter how cyclical my life felt, there was a cycle waiting for me with a happy ending. Brian Henson then made Muppet Treasure Island, which is a film that exists. Standard Muppet movie, really, five out of 10. Brian Henson had proved that the Muppets could live on after Jim Henson. He had kept his father's legacy running despite the huge amount of pressure. After Muppet Treasure Island, Brian Henson took a break and the Henson Company pushed forward with its next Muppet feature without him. This was Muppets from Space and it was a big box office bomb. After this, it was pretty clear that interest in the Muppets were feigning and the Henson family sold the Muppets to Disney. After the deal was made with Disney, the Henson Company is never involved in a Muppet project again. Brian Henson isn't brought on as a consultant or anything, and his career basically stops for 20 years. The Henson Company do a couple of stage shows and TV shows for tiny, tiny babies, but nothing mainstream or popular. Their status as an iconic production company made up of skilled technicians and artists began to fade. Though they did produce some pretty fun and surreal films like Mirror Mask, Five Children and It, and who could forget Rat. But the response to these films can be best described as meek. The company needed to go back to their puppet roots, and as luck would have it, Brian Henson would announce exactly that in 2008. He announced he'd be directing a feature-length film with puppet characters. It was an intriguing premise, an uncensored adult-aimed Muppets movie. It was to star Cameron Diaz and be distributed by Lionsgate. But after a few years, both of them dropped out. The lead role changed to Jamie Foxx, who then dropped out until finally they settled on Melissa McCarthy. And after all that, after 10 years of people dropping out and fighting to get the budget and painstakingly working to get this film fully realized, it's completely shit. But not in the traditional, oh, this is just bad sort of way. This film is the type of bad that just makes me feel sick because I'm dizzying myself with confusion at how anyone even thought this would be in any way a good idea, at how anyone could have written down the dialogue with a smile on their face, or how anyone could have sat for weeks editing this footage, how people could proudly go to the screening and say they contributed towards this disgusting, awful mess. You know your film is fucked up when Sesame Street, a company your father helped create, tries to sue you because their name was put on the marketing for your film, and they felt that was enough for their legacy to be totally shat on. In the first Muppets film, Big Bird walks past Kermit and their crew in this amicable way, as if to wave their respects at each other. And now you have repurposed this brand to sell tickets to your disgusting film. I hope you're proud of yourself, Brian Henson, because I sure aren't. Straight off the bat, this film fails at its primary objective, which is to be funny. This is one of the least funniest films I've ever seen ever. The comedy mostly boils down to the film constantly trying to make us go, Muppets aren't supposed to say the F word, but Muppets aren't supposed to have sex. Muppets aren't supposed to do drugs. It's as if the film was constructed by 14 year olds whose idea of postmodern pastiche humor is making Kermit the Frog finger his own asshole on camera. To give you a sense of what I'm talking about, I'm going to give you an example of what Happy Time Murders is like on a scene by scene basis. 
Our protagonist is a puppet called Phil Phillips. He was the first and only puppet cop, but he lost his badge when he didn't shoot another puppet. Now he's a private investigator. He's investigating a series of puppet murders with his old partner, Melissa McCarthy. They go to this seedy puppet bar filled with criminals and Melissa McCarthy takes drugs. The joke is that instead of cocaine, it's sugar. And then she's high and she's acting all doofy. The chief of police comes and she's, she's real high. So she's acting like a big dumb idiot. And her puppet partner is like, no, no, you've got it all wrong. You're misunderstanding the situation. And this goes on for like three minutes. And then in the next scene, Phil Phillips goes to his office and he fucks this puppet girl. And then he comes. But instead of come, it's, 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 what's it called again? Oh yeah, silly string. He comes silly strings. And in the words of Brian Henson, The reason why it's funny is because of silly string. You know, that's why it's funny. That's right, because otherwise, we'd just be watching a Muppet come for ages. And I can keep saying and then and then and then and keep describing every trash, unfunny comedic scene that this shitty film has in it. I can do it till the cows come home, but that would take like 20 minutes and bore you to death. The pacing is like an old rusted milk float, making its morning milk run. Every scene, it stops to give us a few minutes of terrible improvised comedy. Classic contemporary American comedy shit. Shot reverse shot of the two actors as they do basic escalation dialogue shit. This never results in memorable dialogue moments and usually resides itself to a really bland back and forth argument with childish insults. In the first Muppets movie, there were cameos from both Steve Martin and Richard Pryor. They're barely in the film, but they use their physicality to perform larger than life characters. And in both of these scenes, which couldn't have lasted longer than 20 seconds, there is more original comedy, better performances, and it's more interesting than this entire movie. The design is so depressing as well. I mean, come on, you are literally the Henson Company. They have built themselves around innovative puppet designs and making unique, crazy characters. A big part of the world Jim Henson constructed was that the puppets were different in sizes and in the way they moved. The Swedish chef has human hands. There are little mice and veggies. And Gonzo is a creature that looks like no other character on Earth. You can tell that a lot of work has been put into imagining how each of these characters move and sound. Whereas in Happy Time Murders, apart from some very minor exceptions, all the Muppets in this film are just people with weirdly colored skin. These puppet designs are hardly captivating and because they're so bland looking, so are the characters. The voice actors don't really have a whole lot to work with here. The character of Phil Phillips is a stereotypical cynical noir private investigator who's in a rut. Yet if you look at the way his character has been designed, none of that is communicated visually. Where's the long detective coat? Where's the lit cigarette? Why isn't he constantly consuming whiskey and scribbling in a notebook? If he's so tense and irritable why is he so circular and relaxed looking? He could look pent up and squared and none of these decisions would have affected the tone or the budget. It is just simply lazy. None of these puppets are memorable, which is insane when you think about how many people do Kermit the Frog or Miss Piggy impressions and then realize that no one's gonna go around doing a fucking Phil Phillips voice, are they? Not even 14 year old boys who love Family Guy and toilet humor. Even those simple minded boys won't find the urge in their callous body to recite one one simple line from this abhorrent collection of vomit-inducing moving images. But to complement these uninspired Muppets, we have uninspired directing alongside it. Yippee. Everything is so flat and drained of colour. When you look at Muppet's Christmas Carol, the film he directed 20 years ago, every scene is brimming with characters and conveying a mood and a tone. You get to see these lush, snowy landscapes and filled streets. When the film needs to be dark and broody, it's communicated in every essence possible in the film. Michael Caine's performance, the set design, the lighting, the camera work has a creeping uncertainty to it. Even when you get to Muppet's Treasure Island, there's careful consideration given to how it all looks. Looks. and there's been careful consideration to how the Muppets work within these landscapes. You're never supposed to take the Muppets seriously. There's a sense of irony that comes with them. Seeing the Muppets stand in this rich, warm desert, seeing their fluffy felt bodies contrast with the gravel, or seeing a felt frog singing in an actual swamp. This sense of contrast creates strong comedic imagery. The locations were unique to complement the unique nature of what you were watching and often played with genre conventions in large ways. With Happy Time Murders, nothing stands out or looks unique. The locations never contrast with the Muppets. It's just standard New York buildings. Nothing is communicated visually. 
Remember that scene I mentioned earlier when the two puppets fuck? In Team America World Police, it's the exact same gag, two puppets have sex. Except the music, editing and camera work is working alongside the joke to make it work. None of the jokes in this film work because they're all so half-baked. And even if you are half-baked when you watch this, you'll just get paranoid that the puppets are trying to communicate with you. But despite everything I just said, does this really deserve to be labelled as the worst film of the year? You might think that title should be given to Gotti or Unsane or The Kissing Booth or Solo or The Early Man or The Clock Eye Remake. The reason I've labelled Happy Time Murders as the worst is that this had the opportunity to be the best out of those. It's directed by a man who's worked with puppets his whole life, someone who was born into the industry. When he was a boy he played Hoggle in Labyrinth. His father Jim Henson was 49 when he was working on all the intricacies that made the style and tone of Labyrinth so iconic. Brian Henson is now 53. He had 10 years to think about how he was going to craft Happy Time Murders, how he could put the Henson company back on the radar for innovative filmmaking. But instead, he made a film that feels rushed, cheap and bland. But even when you focus on the script and the practical effects, it's just a repulsive mess. These puppets are sexualized, they have foul mouths and they are completely charmless. Originally, Jim Henson made the Muppets as a way to appeal to everyone. They were this balanced mix of joviality and smart self-awareness. It was accessible to almost anyone. It's hard not to smile when you see the playful madness that the Muppets exert and thrive in. But with Happy Time Murders, the ingredients that made Muppets special and unique have been sucked out. Despite selling itself as the most self-aware Muppets movie ever made, all the self-awareness has gone. There isn't any satire or parody of the detective format, or even an understanding of the genre it's attempting to emulate. It's simply a bare bones detective story written for idiots. It masquerades under a guise of irony, but awkwardly shoving Muppets into an R-rated comedy film isn't enough to make it absurdist. But then you add in Melissa McCarthy to the steaming pot of garbage juice, and you have to watch the world's worst comedian, someone who's less likeable than James Corden, for an hour and a half. It's these combination of things that make The Happy Time Murders the worst film of 2018. Or at least the second worst. But that's not my words. Those are the words of Time Magazine, people. Time Magazine. But what do you think? Do you have a worst film of the year? Let me know in the comments down below. And like, share and subscribe to this channel. It does really make a difference. But if you want to make a difference to your own life, why don't you have a go at Skillshare, the online learning community for creators. With over 25,000 different classes, it's a great place to go if you want to gain a new skill under your belt or to develop an old one like business or pen design. I've been taking Polymatter's introductory class on animation. I found it to be incredibly enlightening and as a result of it, you may see some flashy animations in future nitpicks videos to come. But there's also tons of classes on editing and script writing, all hella useful if you want to have a crack at video making. Skillshare is giving away a free two month unlimited access trial to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. It's a new year, so take that next step to stay learning and become a new you with Skillshare.